Besides the functions already mentioned, the system provides air to the fuel tank for pressurization, to the pod for cooling test instrumentation, and to the windshield for removal of rain for defogging and anti-icing. On the air conditioning panel in the first station are switches by which the pilot may exercise manual control of the system. Note especially the reverse operation switch. This routes cooled air to compartments housing equipment before it goes to the cabin area, thus forestalling possible equipment damage under certain circumstances. With the plane on the ground, reverse is always employed to prevent overheating. For combat pressurization, the pilot has a choice of three schedules, normal, combat, or dump. Of these, the most important to mission capability is combat which by establishing the smaller inside pressure reduces the effects of explosive decompression in case of battle damage. The B-58 fuel system has several built-in advantages. But first, let's see exactly where its tanks are. The forward tank extends across a large area of the forward portion of the wing, including a section of the intervening fuselage. The reservoir tank is in the fuselage behind the third station. The aft tank across the rear wing section and fuselage. While the balance tank, useful in maintaining center of gravity, is located in the fuselage between wing and tail. Providing a plus in range for actual mission is the pod which contains additional tanks in the section surrounding the weapon or equipment. Vital to the system is the automatic center of gravity control. This transfers fuel between tanks for optimum center of gravity positioning under differing flight conditions and at various speeds. Transfer may also be managed by the pilot through override tank selector switches. The receptacle for in-flight refueling of the B-58 is the most compact in use today. Its door retracts into the aircraft during refueling, eliminating the possibility of damage. Important to safety is the clear view of the refueling process afforded the pilot throughout. Masterminding the muscles of the B-58 is the closely integrated flight control autopilot system. Its functions are, of course, primarily associated with the first or pilot station. With the detailed knowledge of the system attainable only by study and experience, let's confine ourselves here to making the acquaintance of a few key elements. First, the primary control surfaces themselves, which are simply the elevons on the trailing edge of the wing, and the rudder in the tail assembly. Next, we have the power control linkage assembly, an internal unit, and the air data computer, an important informational source for the autopilot and flight control. Finally, there are the spikes, one for each engine, whose varying positions at different speeds are of crucial importance to the swift D-58. These, then, are some of the aircraft's principal muscles, controllable by a brain either human or mechanical. Let's now have a closer look at how the components of the flight control system work. As mentioned earlier, the Elevon, pioneered by Convair, constitutes a single control surface which performs the combined functions of the usual aileron and elevator on other aircraft. Initiated by a conventional control stick, movement is relayed through hydraulic actuators to the elevon. A fore and aft stick motion uses the elevons in the role of elevators. In this case, notice that the elevons move an equal distance and parallel to each other. Right or left stick motion results in aileron action with the elevons moving in opposite directions. The two motions may also be used simultaneously in any combination. Stick movement also causes a response in the rudder during actual flight, since a powerful airstream is directed from the elevons to the tail section. Not only a determining, but a limiting factor in controlled surface movement is the speed of the aircraft. For example, 
A stick movement used at slow speed, which produces this much elephant movement, will produce only a small fraction, or this much, at supersonic speed. As an extra safety feature, any sudden, violent, or exaggerated stick motion is automatically reduced in the B-58 so that movement of the aircraft will remain within tolerable limits, especially at high speed. These movements and limitations are implemented by the Power Control Linkage Assembly, which has the job of coordinating the actuation of all control surfaces. Starting with the usual pedal action, independent control of the rudder is transmitted by regulators and cables to the power control linkage assembly, where it is coordinated with the position of the elevon. Then through other mechanical linkages and hydraulic components for actuation of the high standing rudder. Now let's examine briefly the autopilot or mechanical brain to which the human brain may turn over control of flight at will. A distinctive feature of the B-58 autopilot is the air data computer which you will recall is located just aft of the first station. This electromechanical brain receives raw data as to pressures, temperature and the like from various sensory devices in the aircraft such as the pitot tube. After processing this information, the unit then delivers it in the form of electrical signal outputs for use by the flight control system. A key element of the flight control autopilot system is the ingenious variable position inlet spike. First invented specifically for the B-58, it has literally unlocked the solution to one of the most challenging supersonic problems. Let's see what happens to jet engines as they progress from sub to supersonic speed. At supersonic speed, shock waves form at the engine air inlet. This creates a disparity in pressures which reduces the volume of air reaching the inlet and in effect strangles the engine's operation. This condition is corrected by spike positioning, initiated by two sensing devices which are activated by pressure differentials. Movement of the spike forward pushes the shock waves back thus keeping pressure sufficiently equalized to maintain a subsonic airflow. During operations at subsonic speeds, the spike remains in the retracted position. When a preset supersonic speed is reached, an automatic control moves the spike forward in relation to increasing Mach numbers. On the pilot's left are the controls for spike positioning. Auto sets up the system for the automatic process just described. The end position, which is set manually, allows retraction of the spike in case of malfunction in the automatic system during supersonic flight. The retracted position is normal for all ground operations. The out is a spring-loaded guarded position for ground checking purposes only. Even in this case, it must be used with great caution, since holding the spike in the extended position on the ground puts an excessive structural load on the nacelles. This will serve as an introduction to the remarkable combination of muscles and brain, half human, half mechanical, which makes up the flight control autopilot system. An equal partner with the flight control system in getting a B-58 to target and delivering the weapon on target is the bombing navigation system. The bomb nav system is controlled from the second crew station. Again, let's begin by showing the position in the aircraft of the system's chief element. First, we have in a compact assembly midway of the fuselage the primary navigation stabilization unit, commonly called the stable platform or table, and the auxiliary reference unit, together with a nearby astro tracker. Generally considered the heart of the bomb nav system, the stable platform is made up of gyroscopes and accelerometers suspended in a gimbling arrangement. This inertial element is the prime source of velocity, attitude, and directional information required for accurate navigation of the airplane.
In case of malfunction in the primary platform, a pendular stabilized auxiliary reference unit acts as a backup source for this same data. Mounted above the stable platform, the astro tracker peers through a protruding quartz dome. This unit tracks celestial bodies to provide a precision heading reference as well as to take position fixes. Now for a closer look at other components of the system. In the tail section, we find the Doppler radar and the flux valve. The Doppler radar, named in honor of the Austrian physicist, has as its basic operational hardware three transmitting antennas and three receiving antennas which use beams reflected earthward for computing aircraft ground velocity. Note that these antennas are fixed rigidly to the airframe, a feature differentiating it from earlier Doppler radars. The Doppler's job is to provide the system with accurate long-term velocity measurements. Close above the Doppler in the tail is the flux valve, which can be called on as a heading reference. The remaining elements of the system which we will examine are the search radar in the nose of the aircraft, the radio altimeter consisting of two units, the electronic control amplifier situated forward of the second station, and the receiver transmitter antenna radome in the aft section of the right wing. Located in the second station is the in-flight printer. Teamed with all units of the system are the computers, most of which are housed in the second crew station, with some located amidship. You will find a detailed analysis of the functioning of the computers in a later film in this series. Let's move to the B-58 nose for a look at the search radar. Its primary navigational purpose is the removal of dead reckoning errors accumulated during flight. Here is its antenna, which is actuated by electromechanical and hydraulic means in a scanning pattern. Presentation is on a scope in the second station with a wide selection of ranges and sector widths available. to the computers and normally automatic, the search radar can be switched to manual, which permits adjustment by the navigator to his particular purposes of the moment. Perhaps the most important advantage of the manual search radar mode is its continued operation in case of malfunction elsewhere in the bomb nav system. Should this occur, it becomes in fact absolutely vital to mission success. The two operational units of the radio altimeter are the electronic control amplifier in the crawlway ahead of the second station and the receiver transmitter antenna radome. In combination, they measure the time differential between electronic beams transmitted to and received from the ground in order to arrive at continuous altitude above the terrain information. This appears as a readout on the indicator panel in the second station. To wind up, here we have the in-flight printer, which upon actuation automatically records all pertinent navigational data as the flight progresses. These several components round out a well-balanced bomb nav system designed to meet any contingency. The B-58's passive and active defense systems obviously have leading roles in achieving both mission success and safe crew return. The systems may be treated conveniently together since both are functions of the third station. Passive defense, or defensive electronic countermeasures as it is often called, has three basic components. The first two are the radar warning and radar track breakers whose equipment is chiefly centered in the third station. The final component consists of chaff dispensers located in each wing. For the actual hardware of defense, Let's look inside the third station. 
Through the detecting power of antennas housed behind the control panel, the radar warning system does just that, gives early warning of the presence of other radar systems. This takes the form of both visual signals, including positioning of possible hostile radars by quadrant, and audible signals. The radar track breakers, both aft and forward-looking, do their job by delaying and amplifying an intercepted signal, then retransmitting it in distorted form. The chaff dispensers in the wings constitute still another means of countering both search and tracking radar signals. For each of these purposes, a different type of chaff is stored in their hoppers. When used for track breaking, the chaff dispensers are controlled automatically by radar warning equipment. Manual control is needed, however, for operation of the dispenser when using deception chaff against search radar. These interlocking components of passive defense add up to a very effective system for confusing and jamming enemy radar. Active defense in the B-58 focuses around a rapid-fire 20-millimeter Gatling-type gun mounted in the tail. The gunnery equipment of active defense is comprised of a hydraulically operated tail turret and the six-barrel gun itself, with its ammunition box and flexible feed chute. Firing is controlled by a push-button switch in the third station, using information from an all-weather search radar located above the turret, which automatically detects, locks on, and tracks hostile targets. Our discussion of measures for maximum protection of aircraft and crew would not be complete without a mention of the unique escape system designed for the B-58. Early tactical aircraft delivered to the Air Force have been fitted with the so-called interim seat. For a demonstration, let's go to a mock-up. The interim system uses the conventional rails of previous types, but has a more powerful rocket for safe clearance on ejection, and improved extremity restraints for better protection against flailing in the air blast after ejection. For its time, the interim seat was in fact the best available. But the ultimate answer to the problem of crew survival under modern flight conditions had yet to be fully solved. It is being solved in today's B-58 escape capsule. This system, destined to be standard equipment in all tactical hustlers, is predicated on the concept of total enclosure of a crew member, which alone can give the protection necessary for ejection at the speeds and altitudes of high-performance aircraft. The principle of total encapsulation, once established, had to be proved. The system is being proved in a many-sided test program. At Hurricane Mesa, Utah, Sled tests are run at high speeds to simulate problems involved in actual ejection and landing on hazardous terrain. There are static firing tests using slugs, which accurately represent the combined weight of capsule and occupant. Days of flotation testing ensure the capability of survival in the capsule at sea, whether in the heat of the tropics or under conditions of numbing cold. Having as its goal the maximum protection of B-58 crews, this research looking toward perfection of the escape capsule will continue. Even with the B-58 now a familiar sight in the skies, research and testing of this aircraft in its every aspect goes on. For whenever the call, whatever the mission, this outstanding aircraft, the B-58, must be ready, and it will be ready to do the job.